Hi everyone, I'm Cheryl Mahoney and I'm the author of the Guardian of the Opera trilogy, a retelling of the Phantom of the Opera. And the first book, Nocturne, is now available for purchase. It came out June 5th. I'm filming this about a week later. And this is the shortened presentation video. I would have done an in-person launch party, but pandemic. So there is a longer 40 minute video that does basically the presentation I would have done at an in-person party, talking about the book, reading a bit and answering some questions. So if you don't have 40 minutes and that's okay, we're all busy. This is the shorter version. And I'm gonna basically go through the same things, just a little faster. So here's the hardback version. Here is the paperback version. This is an advanced reader copy. Yours will not have that stripe there if you buy it. They are both available for purchase along with the Kindle edition. So go to my blog, MarvelousTales.com, and it'll take you to links to purchase. So let me tell you a little bit about the history of how I came to write this book, because it's more complicated than most of my books. I first encountered The Phantom of the Opera in my senior year of high school. A friend loaned me the Weber soundtrack and I read the Gaston LaRue book. And I really enjoyed them. Within a few months, I was thinking about writing my own story. It was just a sequel originally. I spent about a year writing it from end of high school, first year of college. And it was about the story of what happens after the end of the original events. Spoilers. Christine and Raoul leave the opera. The Phantom is still there. Meg Jury is also still there. And so I explored what happened later to the two of them. And uh, as you may be able to guess, the story is still about Meg Jury. She is a ballet dancer at the opera, so you can see her on the cover there. But a lot of things have changed because I wrote that story. I say story, it was, it was novel length. I put it away, I thought I was done with it but the characters never quite left. So six, seven years later, I didn't like note this down somewhere to tell myself later. I decided to maybe revisit that just a little bit. I was just going to write one scene. I wrote what ended up being chapter one of Nocturne. And it's a scene where Meg is first at the opera. She's 12 years old and she gets lost and she ends up meeting the phantom who helps her find her way. That was a scene that was not in the previous version of the story. I, I never even thought about that happening. So it was something totally new and I was like, I'll just, I'll just write this idea because my ideas about the story and about the character, uh, characters had continued to evolve in the intervening years. I'd read a lot more versions. I just had a lot more thoughts about what is motivating these characters. And that first scene ends up becoming very pivotal to how Meg views the Phantom and all of the events that then continue to unfold. It does really make a difference. So I wrote the one scene, I put it away. I wasn't planning necessarily to continue. I thought I might do this for NaNoWriMo, that's National Novel Writing Month, and just spend you know one month in November, write the story just for fun, get it done, and, and that'll be all. Well, I ended up writing another scene, and then another scene, and pretty soon I had bits and pieces of scenes scattered all over, and I was having so much fun with it, I didn't want to just do it for November. So I did something else for NaNoWriMo that year, and I continued writing random bits of the Phantom story in between my other projects. I also realized very quickly, I think pretty much from the beginning, I needed to actually retell the original story because I wanted to show it from Meg's point of view. I wanted to show who these characters are before we get to afterwards. Uh, they can't just follow from Gaston LaRue or really any other version because they are my version of these characters. And so I needed to show the original events as well. So that's really what Nocturne is. It is mostly the path of the original story with Christine and Raoul leaving near the end. It goes a little bit past that. And then books two and three are really what cover more of the sequel territory, the territory that ended up, well, that was what I wrote before. That ended up being books two and three, but it's very different. I really did not pick up any of that original version. Some ideas are still there, but I completely rewrote it for this. It was a long process. As I said, I started this six or seven years ago. At the time, I thought it was one book, maybe two. I eventually did do 
the story for National Novel Writing Month because I realized I had this huge stack of scenes and I knew the story and the characters so well that I pretty much knew what order they went in, but there were a lot of gaps and holes and I needed to just pull it all together to get a complete beginning to end draft. And I did that for NaNoWriMo, wrote 50,000 words to finish the whole thing. I looked at it scene by scene and I realized, oh, it's actually a trilogy. And that is where we are now with three books. And so I did a lot more revising to make each one work as a separate book. And finally, I'm bringing them out to share with you. So that is the history of where, how this got written. It's complicated. So how is a good question. Why is also a good question. And I feel like in this case, it's why is mine different? Why tell another Phantom of the Opera story? So I already touched on one of the main points, which is that it's a lot about Meg Jerry. It's her view. If you're not familiar with her role in the story, um, as it is in mine, she is the daughter of the Phantom's box keeper. The Phantom has box five reserved and Madame Jerry kind of cleans up the box after performances, leaves programs. She's his box keeper. That's her job at the opera. And uh, so as her daughter, Meg has a little bit of a unique perspective. She is also very good friends with Christine Daae, who of course is very involved with the Phantom. So Meg is hearing about what's going on, seeing some things going on through her connection with Christine. And then she is a ballet dancer herself at the opera, so she's part of the opera world very much so. So it's her view and what her story is. We know what's going on with Christine, or we think we do. But what's going on with Meg? So it's both her view on the familiar events and then her own story and her own efforts to have her own story and not feel like she's just a supporting character. Another thing that makes my story different is my portrayal of the Phantom. Um, he has varied throughout the years since 1909, Gaston LaRue's original story where he was really deeply unstable and unhinged. He's gotten more sympathetic, more romantic, pretty continuously through the intervening 111 years. And I like to think I'm just taking my, that a little bit further, that I really want him to be rational and sane. And that does not mean that he is not deeply complicated and deeply damaged in some ways by what life has done to him and what having a facial deformity has done to him. But he's not completely unstable and unreasonable and irrational. He's complicated. But that means that I can really explore what is motivating him. What brought him to these points where he's doing these things? If we assume he has a motivation, he's not just flying off the handle and dropping a chandelier because, hey, it seemed like fun today. So I have a very sympathetic portrayal of the Phantom. Then third, I have a different view of Christine. And I really don't want to say too much about that because I don't want to give too much away. But Christine will look like she's the Christine you recognize, but she's not. And as you keep reading the book, and definitely as you keep reading the trilogy, you're going to get a picture of a different Christine. I am actually going to release a different video separately that really talks about what I'm just saying vaguely here, because I don't want to give spoilers, but if you don't mind spoilers, there will be another video talking about that. So that really covers kind of the background and the what's different about my book. I'm going to read a little bit for you and uh, then do some Q&A. I have to put my glasses on so that I can read. I don't usually film with them because I don't like how the light reflects, but bear with me. Hopefully it's not too reflective here. So I'm going to read from chapter seven, actually, not, not that first chapter that I was talking about. You can read that first chapter on my blog though, by the way, if you're curious. So I'm reading from when we introduce Christine. There's some earlier sections about Meg and the Phantom. This is when Christine comes into the story. The context of the scene is that Meg came to box five, met her mother there after the performance. They did not expect the Phantom to be there, but they can also tell that he was not there during the performance. He's been hiding out for reasons for a little while now, and Meg is quite disappointed because she thinks it's more exciting when the Phantom is around. So that is where I'm going to pick up the story as they're leaving box five. Mother 
held the door open, and I stepped out, nearly bumping directly into a girl about my age in the busy corridor outside. We exchanged quick, apologetic smiles. I watched her walk away while Mother locked Box 5 behind me. The girl's pink dress was nice, but not expensive enough for a guest. I didn't recognize her as part of the company, and I was sure I would remember her dramatic cluster of brown curls, so she had to be new. Lots of interesting things go on that have nothing to do with the Phantom, Mother said firmly, reclaiming my wandering attention. And you know that. Now go on to the dance foyer. Get to know some pleasant young man and stay out of trouble. I smiled wickedly. I can't do both. I would be worried if I thought you were serious. She quickly tidied my bangs, just as though I was still a child and not 17 years old, turned me around and gave me a light push towards the end of the corridor. Go ahead. I'll meet you to walk home after I finish with the other boxes. In the dance foyer, portraits of ballerinas smiled down on their living counterparts, while gold shone on the walls and on the girls' jewelry. It was mostly gilt, in both cases. A wall of mirrors doubled the apparent size of the already large room, one of the opera's many tricks of illusion. I peered into the mirror, frowning at my smoothed bangs. I could not convince Mother that rumpled hair was the fashion. You needed curls for the right look. Like that girl right over there, just behind me and plainly visible in the mirror. It was the one from the corridor, with her artful brown curls piled on her head, loose strands wisping about her neck. Our glances met in the mirror almost at once, and I turned to face the real girl with a smile. Good evening. I'm sorry for nearly running you down before. Oh, that's all right. Her long lashes made her brown eyes look even bigger as they widened. It was really my fault, hovering in front of the door. I couldn't decide which direction I ought to be going. This place is so confusing. I thought you might be new. I'm Meg Jerry. Christine Daae. But how did you know I was new? With a light laugh, she indicated the crowded room around us. You can't recognize everyone. Or did I just look particularly lost? I know most people around here. And she wasn't the type to blend into the crowd. I had already noticed male glances turning our way, and I didn't bother telling myself that they were looking at me. I've been here for years. Don't worry, you'll get used to the place. She sighed, twisting her fingers together. I hope so. I remembered my own new days all those years ago, and it felt nice being the one who belonged, who understood the world around us. Some girls arrived more confident than others, and this one seemed like she would need more help. Her posture, her anxious glances around the room, all suggested a lost uncertainty. Maybe I could give her some guidance if I knew more about her role here. What level of the ballet are you with? She was old enough for a leading position, but I didn't think she had one. Though she walked gracefully, she didn't move like Sorelli or the other premier ballerinas. The ballet? A tiny crease formed between her perfectly arched eyebrows as she frowned. Oh no, I'm in the chorus. I'm a soprano. A certain pride betrayed itself in her voice as she said it. And why not? Not many people could hit the notes sopranos did. All the same, she was far too tentative and hesitant for me to feel overawed by her singing status. If you're from the chorus, you're in the wrong foyer, I told her, trying not to laugh. The singers have a different reception room than the ballet. Really? She threw her hands in the air, a gesture that should have seemed theatrical yet looked natural from her. You see? Hopelessly confused. I did laugh then because it felt more like a shared joke than like I was mocking her. Don't worry, I won't tell anyone you don't belong. No one's likely to notice and nothing too awful will happen even if they do. I pointed towards an empty banquet. Let's snatch that before some duke sits down and you can tell me when you got here. Christine had been at the Opera Garnier for four days. She had dreamed of being a singer and had studied at the Paris Conservatoire, and now she was here. I told her that I was originally from Leclerc, a village in the south of France, but I had been at the opera for five years with my mother, one of the box keepers. I thought your name sounded familiar, Christine said, and that tiny crease appeared between her brows again. Suddenly her forehead cleared and she said, isn't your mother the Phantom's box keeper? For several years now, I said with a nod. Christine shivered. Don't you find it alarming? I've heard so many horrible stories about the Phantom since I came here. Walls dripping with blood and disembodied heads, no doubt. You sort of get used to him. It's exciting, really. It was bad enough that he had apparently gone away for a while. I couldn't imagine the Opera Garnier permanently without its resident ghost. 
He was the opera's spirit in more ways than one. So that's just a little glimpse into the story, and my shorter video is already getting long. So I am going to end here. There will be some Q&A right after this that I'm going to pick up from the longer video. I'm just going to shorten it down. So don't be surprised if suddenly I'm wearing a different shirt. Thank you for watching, and don't forget you can find the books on my blog, MarvelousTales.com, and it will point you to where to buy them. You can absolutely read my book without already knowing the Phantom of the Opera story. So I wrote it wanting to make it clear and understandable to people who do not already know how the story works and know who the characters are. In some ways, I think you'll have a slightly different impression possibly because you will accept the world as I tell it to you. And some of what I've written is with the idea in mind that people have a concept and I want to slowly bring you around to believing the different way that I am telling the story. So if you don't already have any concepts here and you're coming in blank slate, in some ways it almost might be easier. Easier isn't really the right word. I assume you're just going to accept the world as you find it. If you do actually know the story, it, it's not like that's a disadvantage. Um, you're not going to be confused by what I've written. I think I've actually done more to try to make it clear for people who think they know what's happening. And things might be different. So whether you know the story really, really well or don't know it at all, I think it will work for you. It may just be a little bit different with how surprised you may be by some things in this. So there's really two different approaches to the research, I would say, when you're retelling The Phantom of the Opera, and I pretty much went down both paths. One is to research other versions of The Phantom, because there are so many of them. The other is to research the time and the place, Paris 1880s, the Opera Garnier specifically. And I really explored both of those things. Um, I have done other videos about the many versions of The Phantom of the Opera that I have read or seen. and my version is not any of their versions, but they definitely all brought interesting things to the story and to the characters and sparked some ideas or made me think about some nuances or made me think, oh, the way they're doing that is really cool. I wonder what I can do for mine that is not the same, but is interesting. So I did a lot of research down the path of the Phantom of the Opera and also noticing things from like, that doesn't really make sense how they're telling that. What can I do in mind to explain why things are happening the way they are? So there were a lot of those ideas too. That's what I do with retelling, is try to explain the things that don't make sense. The other path, as I said, is to actually go into the history, as well as the ballet and the classical music for The Phantom. And I read a lot of books for that also. I read a lot of books about the Opera Garnier. I read a lot of books about Paris of the time period. And interestingly, you can get some very interesting essays about the Opera Garnier in the like introductions to copies of The Phantom of the Opera. So that was a useful source. I read a few different introductory essays of, about the Opera Garnier in copies of La Rue's Phantom. I also read a very good book, Marie Dancing. It's a historical fiction novel about a ballet dancer at the Opera Garnier in 1881, which is exactly when my book is set. Uh, it's the model for Degas' statue, Marie dancing, so totally different than my story, but she's inhabiting the same world that my book is also in. And I really wanted to incorporate some of the historical context I think is often not noticed or included in versions of The Phantom of the Opera. So, you know, I was doing that research with the Phantom stories and noticing, huh, they're not thinking about some of this historical stuff that I'm also researching. For example, the class distinction between Raoul and Christine is usually completely ignored, but historically it would have been there. So if you really want to know details about what research I did, there I put two pages on the back about some of the sources that I read into, if you would like to read more, because it's actually hard to find information and I had to do some digging. So I'm like, if someone else wants to know more, I'm going to tell them the things that I found. 
So I visited the Opera Garnier, the real life one in Paris, twice over the course of the writing and it definitely gave me some ideas because it was the first time it really felt like a real tangible place. When you read LaRue, it's just kind of this endless, endless labyrinthine building that goes on forever. It is a world unto itself, which it still kind of is in my book, but that's in a more metaphorical sense. Being there in person made me realize, oh, it's, it's a building. You can like walk all the way around it. It's not actually endless. The Louvre was kind of endless, but the Garnier, the Opera Garnier is comparatively contained. So I think that influenced how I created the setting. Definitely some of the principal rooms that we see throughout the book are rooms that were on the tour. They're also the most striking, most impressive places. I mean, the auditorium, the grand stair, the grand foyer. There's a reason they're on the tour. There's a reason they're in the story. It's slightly overlapping, but uh, I learned some interesting details about the Opera House as well that did work their way in. The Grand Foyer, a lot of the gold is actually paint. I love that because it's a theater, it's illusion. That shows up a couple of times, I think in book two and three. So knowing it was a real building and an actual tangible space, I think did influence some of the ways I set the story, some of the ways I regarded the characters. And there is a choice that Christine makes well into the book that I won't spoil, but being there made me think about her choice a little bit differently and realize, huh, there's something a little strange about this. But you will have to read the book to find out more about that. So I would recommend reading them in order. They stand alone in the extent, in the sense that they are complete books, but book two does follow from book one, book three follows from book two. Uh, my previous series, the Beyond the Tales Quartet, was meant to stand completely alone. You can read them in any order, it does not matter. That's not how this trilogy is. They are meant to be read in order because it is a continuing story and a continuing arc of the characters. I wrote them out of order, but you probably shouldn't read them out of order.